Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore, music by Claude Sweet. from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, if yours is a family of average size, you probably consume six or more loaves of bread a week. Now, that adds up to a lot of slices. And to make it add up to a lot of good eating enjoyment, too, spread your bread, toast, or sandwiches with delicious, nourishing parquet margarine made by Kraft. Parquet's fresh, delicate flavor really satisfies. Makes bread rolls, pancakes, and waffles taste so good you'll want to eat more. And as for good nutrition, listen to this. Parquet is actually one of the best energy foods you can eat and contains dependable amounts of vitamin A. Kraft, you see, adds vitamin A to parquet so that every pound contains 9,000 units and there's never any less summer or winter. So for flavor that really satisfies for energy and vitamin A, be sure to get parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, Kraft makes parquet. Let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. After weeks of correspondence with his old friend, Fibber McGee and Wistful Vista, a model of McGee's plastic mousetrap has arrived by special delivery. With Marjorie and Leroy at his heels, Gildersleeve bears it triumphantly out to the kitchen. Well, Bertie, there it is. The world's first plastic mousetrap. Looks good, huh, Bertie? Yeah, it looks good, but it sure don't look like a mousetrap. Well, this is no ordinary mousetrap, Bertie. Look, I'll show you how it works. Mr. Mouse walks in here... Walks along this little path in here, turns through here, and bingo, he falls through here. If he don't get lost first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Gillsleeve, if you say so, it's a mouse trap. Well, what you gonna use for bait? Bait? Well, haven't we... Uh... Not a thing, Mr. Gillsleeve. I don't think there's a thing in the house that would really appetize a mouse. There must be something. How about bacon? The points are off it. The points are off of it, but there ain't no bacon. Oh. <laughs> uh, too good for him anyway. Now, let's think now. What would I like if I were a mouse? A piece of pie and a glass of milk. <laughs> we don't need a provided chaser, Leroy. Pie isn't a bad idea, though. Apple pie? How about a piece of apple? Mice love apples. We ain't got any apples either, Miss Marjorie. Well, now let's be scientific. What have the mice been getting into, Bertie? Pancake flour. But you can't bait a trap with pancake flour. You could make them a pancake. You could, Miss. All right, Leroy. I guess we'll have to get something tomorrow. Confound it, this is very annoying, Bertie. Brand new mousetrap, an invention that's going to make us millions of dollars, and nothing to bait it with. Well, those are the brakes, kid. You go to bed, Leroy. What? Go to bed. We'll just leave the trap here by the pancake flour, Bertie. Who knows? Maybe Mousy will walk into it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wait a minute, Leroy. Have you finished your breakfast? Holy cow, I had 11 pancakes. I'm shoving off. I'll see you later. Just a minute. Uh, you too, Marjorie. I want to hold a family conference. About what? Well, I'm going to have to ask you children for a little cooperation. Bertie, you too. You see, uh, all the money's going out these days and none of it's coming in. Yeah, how about that, Unc? When are you going to get off the dime? <laughs> I don't understand that expression, Leroy, and I don't think I like it either. Well, aren't you ever going to get a job? If you'll be quiet a minute. I know just the job, Uncle Mort. Holden Brothers need a floor walker. Floor walker? They have a sign in the window. Yeah, I guess that's the easiest job there is, Uncle. Why don't you grab it? A man doesn't step out of a career in the public service to become a floor walker. I'm not looking for a job anyway. I'm merely asking you people to hold down on expenses. McGee and I are going to need every cent we can scrape together to get into production. Uncle Mort, I've been thinking... Why don't you be a diplomat? Diplomat? Yeah. It'll be wonderful to travel around in foreign countries and go to state dinners and formal balls. Don't you think so? 
Yes, it would. Of course, that's not all there is to it, my dear. <laughs> Say, I wonder how you get into that. <laughs> have to have a pull, I suppose. Well, you must know somebody in Washington, don't you? Fellow I went to college with has a job in the Department of Agriculture. I wonder if he knows how. Ah, uh, you can't be a diplomat unless you can talk all kinds of languages. Well? Parlez-vous français, El Camorre? No, but I bet I could pick it up in a hurry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bernie, how'd you like to live in France? Voulez-vous? Oui, oui, Mr. Gill, please. Bon coup. Yeah. <laughs> Bertie, where did you learn French? My brother learned a little French in the last war, and he just passed it along. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear Bertie hobnobbing with a French chef. Mademoiselle, should the filet of sole be cooked commissi or commissar? Say, you're pretty good, too, Aunt. Gosh, I'm the only one in the family that can't talk French. Well, we'll put you in a French school, Leroy. You'll be talking like a native. Jeepers, would piggy banks be surprised? Let's do it, Uncle. Well, I might look into it. Uh, see who that is, will you, my boy? Yeah, it's probably Piggy. Can I go now if it's Piggy? Yeah, we'll see. Hello? Yeah, just a sec. For you, Uncle. Oh, thank you, my boy. Yeah. Hello? The indicator. Well... Uh, see who's at the door, will you, Bertie? Okay. Uh, I was talking to someone at this end. Uh, yes, I'd be very glad to see you. This morning would be fine. Oh, no, thank you, miss. Goodbye. He's right in here, Judge. Thank you, Bertie. Well, good morning, all. Judge, golf knickers. <laughs> I haven't seen a pair in years. Rimony, get him. <laughs> Nothing so extraordinary about golf knickers. I thought it was getting a little chilly, and they might feel nice later on in the afternoon. Come on, Gildy. We need you to fill out the fumbling forces. Sorry, Judge, but I'm being interviewed by the press in a few moments. Well, for goodness sake, about what? About my plans for the future and so on. Uncle Mort is thinking of going back to work. Don't misquote me, my dear. <laughs> well, about time. Yeah, we were just discussing the possibility of a diplomatic career, Judge. You? A diplomat? Why not? <laughs> Well, what's so funny? You? You a diplomat? <laughs> I'm sorry, Gildy, but I think that's the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> I don't see anything funny about it. I'd love it. Same here. Well, it would be fine for you children, but... <laughs> <laughs> now, see here, Hooker. I'm sorry, Gildy. I'm terribly sorry. But the diplomatic career is not for you. Why? Well, in the first place... You have to be a millionaire. And in the second place, you're the most undiplomatic man I ever met. How would you like a punch in the nose, you old goat? Why, George, you'd get one if you weren't such an old, old goat. Well, there's a fair sample of your diplomacy. The punch in the nose isn't being used this season at Dumbarton Oaks. If you were there, it would be. Now, look at it reasonably, Gildy. You know a diplomat's salary is nothing. He has to entertain out of his own pocket. All these state dinners of Marjorie's, you pay for them. Gee, never thought of that. Nobody but a millionaire can afford to take the job. Yeah, you're right. I'd forgotten that. I'm glad you dropped in before I wrote to Washington. Yeah, Unc has the job practically sewed up. Yes. Well, why don't you stop fooling around and get busy and find yourself a permanent connection that'll keep your family from want? Listen, Hooker, I don't want any permanent connection. In a few weeks, McGee and I will be in production with our mousetrap. Mousetrap? Yes. And this mousetrap is going to be bigger than you or me. Oh, fiddle. Why don't you go out to the war plant and see Nelson Humpstone? I can fix it up. Now, what for do you. I want to see him for? Humpstone is a big man. If he was a big man, you wouldn't know him. Why should I go out there with my hat in my hand? You know, Gildy, I believe you're afraid you'd get a job. Nothing of the kind. Then why don't you let me fix it up with Humpstone? Why are you so anxious for me to see Humpstone, Judge? Are you getting a commission on this? That's a nice thing to say to a friend. Yes, yes. Oh. Must be the lady from the indicator. If you excuse me, Judge. Don't worry, I'm leaving. Sore head. You're just jealous because she isn't interviewing you. It so happens, my friend, that she interviewed me three months ago. When she comes to see you, she's getting pretty near the bottom of the barrel. Why? <laughs> Go on, get out of here, get out of here. Gildersleeve, that's all very interesting about your early life, but I want to know about your plans for the future. I understand you're thinking of going into manufacturing. Thinking of it? I'm certainly going into manufacturing. Going to manufacture a plastic mousetrap. Revolutionary. Oh, yes, uh, plastic. Oh, but it's not an ordinary plastic. My partner, Mr. Fibber McGee of Wistful Vista, he invented the trap. He's worked out an entirely new plastic. It's cheaper than soybean plastic, made out of soybeans and rhubarb. <laughs> 
Why is that cheaper? Cheaper? Well, because nobody likes rhubarb. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that should be a nice little business. Uh, it won't be little very long, miss. Mousetraps is just the first step. Plant number one. Then will come plastic dishes, plastic radios, alarm clocks, plastic pianos. Houses? Certainly. Stocking? Undoubtedly. By in no time at all, Summerfield will be the plastic capital of the world, surrounded by acres of soybeans and rhubarb. That's simply marvelous, Mr. Gildersleeve. You'll go down in history as Summerfield's greatest benefactor. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, will you be able to print all this? Oh, yes. But I ought to get back to the office now and start writing it. Oh, uh, just one more thing. Uh, when do you think you will actually get into production? Any minute, my dear. Almost any minute. Then I'd better hurry. Uh, huh? Uh. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, it's been very interesting. Well, thank you. If you uh, need any more figures or facts, feel perfectly free to call on me. I will. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Goodbye, miss. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, I guess that'll show this town who's a big man. I guess that'll make a few people sit up and hey, think... Uh, uh, the mouse! Eureka! We've caught a mouse. The age of plastics has begun. Oh, no. Where's the mouse, Leroy? We'll have him stuffed and keep him as a historic souvenir. A monument. Not this mouse, Unc. He ate a past the trap and ran away. Ate it? Oh! <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Time for a quick word picture of a contented man eating breakfast. Pop goes the toaster, out comes a slice of bread, toasted to a tempting golden brown. An eager hand reaches for a delicious nourishing spread, reaches for parquet margarine, adds the appetizing flavor goodness of parquet to the piping hot toast. Man, oh man, there's a breakfast treat that's sure to send anybody whistling off to work. Crunchy toast spread with delicious, satisfying parquet margarine. And lots of nourishment to go right along with that grand flavor enjoyment. Yes, lots of good nourishment because parquet is high in food energy value. And because every single pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. Why not make your breakfast tomorrow a real humdinger of a meal with the help of delicious nourishing parquet. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, Kraft makes parquet. Let's return now to the great Gildersleeve. Despite the glowing story the indicator has published about him, it's a chastened Gildersleeve we find on Monday morning. He's come to the conclusion that he was a little hasty in brushing off Judge Hooker's offer to help him get a job at the war plant, and he's set out in search of his old friend now to patch things up. Finding him shouldn't be too difficult, for his daily schedule is as unvarying as a timetable. At exactly 9.17 each morning, the judge steps into Floyd Munson's barber shop for a shave. Oh, 9.30 right now. Floyd is probably down around his Adam's apple. Oh, Rockmorton. Oh, hello, Leela. Rockmorton, just a minute. Yes, sorry, Leela. <laughs> a little busy right now. Well, I, I was just going to phone you. Phone me? You do that, Leela. You do that. But Rockmorton, yeah, I... I've got to catch the judge before he leaves here. You'd care to step in with me? Into a barber shop? Well, then phone me later. That's a good girl. If I'm not in, leave a message. Hi, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, Floyd. Hi, Mrs. Ransom. How's it going? Ransom. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 good morning, Judge. Good morning. Uh, uh, fine morning. Yes, indeed. Fine morning. Hey, you are, Judge. Fresh to the daisy. Thank you, Floyd. Seems to be getting a little colder these days, Judge. My collar and tie, please, Floyd. Here you are, Judge. Uh, Horace, if I've said or done anything to hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. Now, about that job, I think it was a great idea you had there for me to get in touch with Humpstone. Then go ahead and get in touch with him. But you know him, Judge, and I don't. I thought if you could just fix it up for us to meet... My me... coat, please. Boy. Yes, sir. Now, seriously, Horace, I said I was sorry, didn't I? What more can I do? Hey, wait a minute. Uh, Horace, seriously, listen, you don't have to get huffy just because I happen to... Horace! All right, go on, go on, you stubborn old goat. No, I ask you, Floyd. I ask you seriously. Judge seems a little peed this morning. Uh, old rooster. I didn't tell him, but his shoes untied. I hope he trips. <laughs> Say, I uh, saw that article about you in the paper there, Commissioner. Oh yes, yes. Quite a write-up. Not giving away any stock in that mousetrap company of yours, are you? 
Not given away any samples. No, we, uh, we haven't exactly got it organized yet, Floyd. You might say it's pending. Uh-huh. Fella come in here and sold me some oil stock back around 1928. That's pending, too. <laughs> well, this is different. Uh, say, Floyd. Uh-huh. Uh, you don't happen to know this fellow Nelson Humpstone, do you? The manager out at the factory? Nelson Humpstone? Yeah, I know him. You do? Oh, that's fine. Well, I say I know him. He comes in here for haircuts. He does? The next time he comes in, Floyd. I wonder if well, you Well, I say he comes in for haircuts. He came in once. Oh. Uh, did you get a chance to talk with him? Yeah, I talked with him. What kind of a man is he, Floyd? Nice fellow? What'd you two talk about? Well, I say I talked with him. I did most of the talking. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. Fella comes in, he don't say much. Sits down in the chair, remarks he'd like a shave. So, okay, I start in. First I mention it's a nice day out. Never mind what you said. What did he say? Didn't commit himself much one way or the other. So then I ask him who's going to win the election. That usually gets him if the weather don't. Uh, what did he say? Said he hadn't made up his mind. And with that, he shuts his eyes like he was going to sleep. So I says to myself, okay, if he don't want to talk, okay. I'm not one of these barbers that runs off at the mouth all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. If a man, <laughs> if a man don't want to talk, that's all right with me. I can take a hint. Sometimes I don't want to talk myself. Sometimes I'll be quiet for whole minutes at a time. Just thinking. <laughs> The wife says to me at night sometimes, Floyd, for goodness sake, she says, why don't you stop thrashing around and go to sleep? Just thinking. Getting back to Humpstone, Floyd. Oh, yeah. So he's laying there with his eyes closed, and I'm shaving him. Well, I might have never heard another peep out of him, only the razor slipped. You call yourself a barber? Well, your razor would have slipped, too. It would? What do you mean? Well, I'm looking out the window, and I happen to see one of the Bagley sisters waltzing by. So I wave to her with my razor. Just being friendly, you know what I mean? And who comes along right behind her but the wife? Boy, I got back to work so fast, no wonder I nicked him. <laughs> well, uh, what did he do, ball you out? No, it's a funny thing. He just opens one eye and says, watch it. <laughs> Gave me a quarter, too, when he left. But you know, he's never come back. Funny fellow, Humpstone. Hard to figure out. Yeah, well, I can see you aren't going to be much help to me, Floyd. I'm oh, sorry, Commissioner. Uh, you don't know anybody else who knows him? Mm, might try Peavy. How would Peavy know him? Well, I'll tell you, I always seem to be out of court plaster here somehow, so when I run into a little bad luck with a customer, I usually send him along to the drugstore, and Peavy patches them up. No wonder he has time for anything else. Yeah, well, I drew blood with Humpstone there, so who knows? Maybe him and Peavy struck up an acquaintance. I'll try him, Floyd. Goodbye. So long, Commissioner. Be seeing you at the Jolly Boys Club tomorrow night? That depends, Floyd. Depends on how jolly I feel. Well, hello, Peavy. Just reading a little item about you in the paper here. Very complimentary. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, Peavy, you don't happen to know this Nelson Humpstone, do you? Nelson Humpstone? Yeah. Manager out to war plant? Yeah. That plant used to be the old tech factory before they took it over. Yeah, that's the one. A large man, a little tall on you. Yeah, do you know him? No, Mr. Gelderson, I don't know. <laughs> I've seen him around. But Floyd said he'd been in here. He said he sent him in here one day with a cut on his chin. Well, so many come in here with cuts on their chin, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's a little hard to remember. Uh, Why are you so interested in Mr. Humpstone? I'm very anxious to contact him in regard to a, a business matter. Oh, a business matter. Yes, a very important one. Important. It has to do with employment. Employment. Uh, post-war? Right now. You must know, Peavy, I've got to get a job. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't understand. It says in the paper there about your plans for the future. Baloney, Peavy, all baloney. But what about Mr. McGee and his... Put not your trust in McGee. That was my mistake. Five whole weeks waiting around, and what have I got to show for it? Frankly, I don't know what I'm going to do, Peavy. Well, if $50 would help to tide you over, I... Thanks, Peavy. I'm not hard up. Not yet. Just worried, that's all. But you're a real friend. I'll remember this. That's all right, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, speaking of friends, there goes Mrs. Ransom. Let her go. I have no time for dames now. My problem is to get in touch with Nelson Humpstone. Oh, looks as if she's coming in. Oh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Ransom. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Rock Martin, you've been avoiding me. 
Now, Leela, not at all. I'm a little busy today, that's all. <laughs> you don't deserve it, Throckmorton, but I've been trying to invite you to dinner this evening. Oh, well, that's very nice, Leela, but I don't know about this evening. You see, Throckmorton, I... I simply refuse to take no for an answer. A friend of mine wants to meet you, Nelson Humpstone. Well, that's very good. Nelson, 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 Nelson Humpstone? <laughs> Leela, is Nelson Humpstone a friend of yours? Well, I only met him last weekend at the country club, but we got along famously, if I do say so. And Nelson Humpstone wants to meet me? He called me up specially this morning before I was hardly awake. <laughs> Peavy, it's a small world. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> well, I told him I'd try to have you both to dinner this evening, Frank Martin. Do you think you could make it? Leela, I think that could be arranged. <laughs> matter of organization. Organization or know-how? They said it couldn't be done. Humpstone, they said, it can't be done. Well, uh, sir, Excuse I... me. Uh, Bertie, I'm afraid Mr. Humpstone's glass is empty. Yes, ma'am. Oh, forgive me, Mr. Humpstone. Continue. You're sure this is not boring? Oh, Grace, it's not at all. I think it's fascinating. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> well, sir, you won't believe this, but as of August 1st, we were turning them out at the rate of 90,000 a day. That's over 600,000 per week. Say, that's nothing. At the time I resigned from the water department, do you know how many gallons we were pumping? 800,000 per. Per week? No, per month. <laughs> when you think of that in quartz, brother, that's a lot of water. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Gilsey, but how about another little piece of peach shortcake, huh? I've got just one slice left. Uh, no, Bertie, that's for the guest of honor, Mr. Humpstone. Oh, I couldn't. Oh, uh, but I insist. Uh, no, oh, really. Oh, Mr. Humpstone, please. I really shouldn't. Pretty please. <laughs> Well... <laughs> I'll take it as a personal insult if you don't. That's an old southern recipe I learned in Savannah. <laughs> yeah, what's the matter, Bertie? That ain't no southern recipe. I got that recipe off the fly day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bertie is such a jewel. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve was kind enough to lend it to me for the evening. I hope he'll be kind enough to take her with him when he goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wherever know. the recipe came from, the shortcake is delicious. Yeah. In fact, the whole dinner has been delicious. Thanks. I mean, yes, it has, Leela. <laughs> it's such a relief to get away from restaurants and enjoy a good home-cooked meal for a change. Oh, you're not married, then? No, I never seem to have found the time somehow. Hmm, how interesting. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I should have invited another girl this evening for Throckmorton, but, uh, well, I decided I'd just keep you two men all to myself. Wasn't I wicked? <laughs> have a cigar, Mr. Humpster. Uh, no, try one of mine. No, no, have one of these. They're two for 35. Uh, these are imported. I'd like to know what you think of them. Uh, well, in that case, fair exchange is no robbery, I guess. <laughs> you don't mind, Mrs. Ransom? Oh, not at all, Gracious. I love the smell of cigars. Oh, have one, Leela. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Trockman, you're outrageous. I am. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I know you men have things you want to talk over, so I'll just leave you alone with your cigars. Oh, don't get up. Oh, I insist. Oh, allow me. Oh, thank you, Gracious. It's so long since anybody's pulled out my chair for me. Now, don't you talk about me when I'm gone, you hear? <laughs> charming woman, charming. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, Mr. Hupstone. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure meeting you this evening. Something I've been looking forward to. Well, I think I can safely say that the feeling is mutual, Mr. Hupstone. Yes, sir. I, um... Uh, I understand you resigned from the water department here to go into private industry. Oh, yes, yes. I've had numerous offers, which I'm considering at the moment. I haven't decided on any yet. I believe I read something in the paper about your planning to form a company and uh, go into production shortly on some uh, household article. Uh, mousetrap, was it? Oh, yes, that. Well, there are still a few bugs in that we'll have to get ironed out. Have to change the formula, I'm afraid. That'd make it so tasty. Mm. 
Uh, that's more in the nature of a hobby with me anyway, though. Uh, that is to say, it wouldn't prevent my working at something else. Oh, I see. Yes. I foresee a great big future for the post-war industry, Mr. Humpstone. A big future. I have great faith in it. Oh, I quite agree. As a matter of fact, that's something I'd like to talk with you about. Please feel perfectly free to do so. Oh, thank you. You're with the International Bolt and Screw, are you not? Well, the factory here is a subsidiary. Yes, I understand. Very fine organization, International Bolt and Screw, from what I hear. Yes, quite an outfit, IBS. Quite an outfit. Large. Very. Must take a lot of men to run it. Yes, it does. Uh, I was thinking, Mr. Humpstone, you'll be expanding after the war. You'll be taking on more men for peacetime production. And it's not too early now to start planning ahead. Oh, but there you're wrong, Mr. Gildersleeve. The company's already cutting down. Cutting down? <laughs> yes. You see, this factory was only open to take care of government contracts. Now that the contracts are being terminated, unfortunately... Uh... <sighs> Uh, guess there's not much use in my asking you for a job, then. <laughs> asking me for one? I was going to ask you for one. <laughs> Why, you four-flusher? You got me over here to dinner just so that you could ask now, me... just a minute, just a minute. Didn't you do the same? What? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did. Confounded, Humpstone. Do you realize there's another income tax installment due December 15th? Do I realize it? I'm a month overdue on the last one. And with prices what they are? You know, I paid a grocery bill of $97 last month. $97. I can well believe it. I wish you could see my hotel bill. And my car. Falling to pieces. Got to have my brakes relined. Tell you, Humpstone, I don't know what this country is coming to. Quiet. Here comes our hostess. Oh. Well, I suppose you've settled the fate of the world, you two. Uh, won't you join me in the pond? Oh, by all means. Uh, after you, Mr. Humpstone. Oh, no, after you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Thank you. Yes, as I was saying, Mr. Humpstone, my faith in the future of post-war industry in this country remains unwavering. Exactly my opinion, Mr. Gildersleeve. We see eye to eye. Yes, sir. I believe we face a future that'll be measured not in thousands, not in millions, but in billions. Let me know if you hear of anything, Humpy. <laughs> I'll do that, Gildy. Yes, sir. There are great days ahead. And it's good. Well, Peavy. That's the way it is. McGee turned out to be a faker, and Humpstone was a fraud. Well, you know what they say, Mr. Gildersleeve. The best laid plans of mice and men gang after glee. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, it's all water over the dam now, anyway. Just have to get out and find work, I guess. That's the main thing, anyway, to be working. They say it's work that makes the world go round. Honest toil, nothing to be ashamed of. Work. Yeah, I guess that's the most important thing in a man's life. His work. That's right. Yes, sir. Work. By George, how I hate it. <laughs> Good night, Peavy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. This program was directed by Clark Sweeten. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Staff invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. The crispness in the air these brisk autumn days is your cue to add more zest, more flavor sparkle to foods. Yes, appetites are sharper, so now's the time to zip up food flavors with Kraft prepared mustards. One popular variety you'll surely want to try is tangy golden Kraft salad mustard. The mustard that's so mild yet so downright appetizing. Blended into cooked foods or added to tempting sandwich spreads, lively salad dressings, and delicious fillings for deviled eggs. If you're baking a ham, be sure to mix Kraft salad mustard in with your brown sugar coating to seal in the ham savory juices and to add an extra flavor tang. Also, be sure to stock up tomorrow on that other popular favorite, the sharper Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added. Your dealer has both delicious varieties. Both are sure to please. 
So remember to buy nippy Kraft horseradish mustard and tangy golden Kraft salad mustard. This is the National Broadcasting Company.